Today we are in the first installment of what is going to be a six-week series called Truth Over Trend, where we're going to be diving into topics that culture has embraced, but very often the church has avoided these conversations. But how many you know as followers of Christ, we're not called to hide from these conversations, we're called to shine light in the midst of darkness. And today's topic is a huge one. It needs a lot of light. The topic today is the transgender movement and homosexuality. Now, let me just kind of say right off the bat, this series is an equal opportunity offender. If I don't offend you today, come back next week. I promise I'll offend you later, okay? So if you came today and you feel like, well, I feel targeted, don't worry. I'm coming at everybody. Today may be your day. Next week may be somebody else's day. But it's so important when we talk about this subject matter, about the transgenderism and homosexuality, that we understand um, where, what, our, what our church, our church stance is it. And there's, I think it's important for us to understand that. I think there's three traditional um, responses and stances that church has made on this, and you should know our stance. The, the, the traditional response is, though, some churches have, have used alienation, where they say, well, like, you're not welcome here, and I'm going to tell you right up front, let me go on the record and say, that's not the heart of this house, you are welcome here, okay? We love you, that's not who we are, okay? But that is a response that some people have, alienation. The next response that we've seen over tradition and over the years is affirmation, where some churches will say, well, culture is right and the Bible is wrong and we choose to tear those particular pages out of the Bible or redefine those words to maybe fit our cultural narrative. And you need to know that's not who we are either. We choose to stand on the truth of God's word. So we're not affirming, listen, what God calls sin, just like, let me just step into this real quick, just like we would not affirm a woman who cheats on her husband and commits adultery, or, or a man who cheats on her wife and commits adultery, or people who live in a hookup culture, or people who gossip or slander, and we could go through a whole list of sins the Bible talks about. So when you think you're doing pretty good, and you're like, oh, he's talking about them, just read a few more pages in the Bible, okay? It'll get to your section. Keep reading. So we're not... We're not affirming what the world, uh, what the word calls sin, but we're accepting. What I mean by accepting is that everyone's in broken and in need. Someone told me a while ago, man, they're like, you know what? We just need to, you need to tell them to leave the church. And if that's the mindset, let me, if you have that mindset, you are so far away from the heart of God and the mind of God. All are welcome to discover Jesus, to discover truth. Everyone is welcome. The foot is even at the cross. Every single one of us needs forgiveness and needs salvation and needs grace. So some people use alienation. Some respond with affirmation. Another response to the church has been avoidance, where they just don't talk about this at all. Let's not talk about it. It's not for us even. Some people say the church shouldn't talk about these subjects. And then the world and culture and the enemy has filled the vacuum of the void where truth has not been declared and present. So, so we're, not, we're not a church that uses alienation, affirmation, or avoidance. We are a church that's going to address the cultural issues. We're gonna address it, we're gonna address it, but it's important how we address this issue. It's extremely important how we have this conversation. First Peter chapter three, verse 15, he says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. That's very important that we start off and Peter's starting off here. It's a hard thing, who is Lord? of your life. Let's, let's make the decision. Okay, in my heart, first and foremost here, Jesus is Lord. It's not me. I'm not, I'm not the boss. You know, the culture is not the boss. No one else gets to say right and wrong. Jesus is Lord. Always, he says, be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. And that's one of the reasons why we're doing this series, so that you would have an answer for the hope. But he says, but do this with gentleness and respect. There's a way that we can talk about this. We're not here, look, I'm not here to provoke anger or to be belligerent, but church, we must wake up. We must wake up. This is spiritual warfare. This is an attack of the enemy on our children and in our generation. We are where we are today because we were, we're, we were pushed out. No one pushed us out, but because of we wanted our children, Christians, listen, we wanted our children to be identified as athletes or scholars or influencers and not as Christ followers first. We've given our hearts to other passions and we're reaping the consequences in our society. 
So here's the decision that each of us must make. Will the word override the world? Or will the world override the word? This is a crucial choice that we are making. Will you put the truth over the trend? But let's be clear, there is a constant conflict between these two, what the word says and what the world says. Jesus said it like this, or it says this about Jesus in John chapter 1, verse 14, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus embodied both of these things. It's not either or. It's, it's not one or the other, because truth without grace is harsh, but, but grace without truth is hollow. We need both, and I'm here to deliver to you both today in Jesus' name. The biggest obstacle, though, that we have in addressing this topic today is truth sounds like hate to those who hate truth. See, this conversation is so hard to have because, because there is an attack on truth. Truth is very relative and subjective, and it almost, to a lot of people, sounds like hate, but it's only that we hate the truth, or we don't even believe that there is an objective truth. Today, we're facing a cultural movement that is redefining gender, sexuality, identity. In schools and in media, we're seeing things like this, the gender unicorn. I don't know if you've seen this guy. They're teaching this in, in schools. They're, they're introducing this in kindergarten. They're showing uh, children that gender is fluid and having conversations with our kids about who they're physically attracted to or emotionally attracted to in kindergarten to teach that, that this is a fluid. It doesn't, it's separate from biological sex. Let me define what they mean by gender identity. Gender identity, according to this movement, is this. It's a personal sense of being male, female, both, or somewhere in between, completely detached from one's biological sex. So they claim that this is based on feeling and self-perception rather than the undeniable biological factors God has designed. Now this ideology, it might seem like it's built on compassion, but let's not be fooled. Any ideology that separates us from our God-given identity that says biology is secondary to feelings, listen to me, is a deception of the enemy. We need to recognize this for what it is. It's a man-made attempt to redefine God's creation. And I wanna explore this with you today. And the way we're gonna do it is I'm gonna answer four critical questions from God's word, and then we're going to read like a whole chapter of the Bible together. I know, we're just, we're just gonna let the Bible, like, like we're gonna read the word of God together and interpret it. And then I'm gonna give you like a response that we can, because the questions that I'm gonna show you, they're foundational because they help us understand who we are, how we're created, and how we navigate the broken word. And these, are, these are not just philosophical questions and scientific questions. These are spiritual questions that impact our identity, our relationships, and our faith. How many are ready to dive in? Y'all ready? Okay, let's address this one of the most basic questions. What makes a biological male or female? 10 years ago, I would have never thought I would actually ask this question and preach a message and have to explain what actually makes a biological male or female. In fact, 10 years ago, if I was so, shown this image right here, I would have thought, I would have thought that, that my brother had a bit too much barbecue uh, or something like that. Like, cause this is me sometimes after like, the all-you-can-eat tacos after the wedding reception. I'm like, dang. I would not have thought what this is supposed to depict. Culture today tries to tell us that it's all a matter of self-identity and feeling, but God has created the human body with specific markers that determine sex. So let's unpack this. What scientists say are the three primary factors that determine biological sex, three primary factors. Number one is this, reproduction. Reproduction. So, so God has designed our bodies with a reproductive system that serves specific purposes, and males have, have specific reproductive systems that produce sperm, and females have specific reproductive systems that produce eggs. It's not about a label we put on someone. It's about a functionality that God built inside of us. So it's reproduction. The second question is, or second factor, is the external anatomy. 
okay? The, the, the males and females were born with different physical characteristics that align with their biological sex. In fact, the one, there's like one part of who you are that does not work without the other person, the way it was intended, okay, without the other gender. And while culture may try to blur the lines, they remain very clear and undeniable. There are external anatomy factors that, that is an indicator of biological sex. And the third one that scientists say is the indicator of biological sex is your chromosomes. Okay, at a genetic level, your chromosomes. Most people are born with an XX chromosome or, or you know, for females, an XY chromosomes. For male, when people argue that sex is assigned, assigned at birth, they misunderstand. Doctors do not assign sex at birth, they recognize it based upon these factors. It's not a random decision, it's a reflection of biological reality. Now, every time this gets brought up, some people point out intersex conditions. Well, what about intersex people where some people are born with atypical chromosomal or, 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 or anatomical features as evidence of maybe additional genders, but these conditions are rare, extremely rare occurring, according to the statistics, approximately 0.022% to upwards of 1.7% of the population is born with some kind of chromosomal, chromosomal or anatomical feature difference. And even that 1.7% is very suspect. It is like a, a radical stretching of the data to get to the most possible of 1.7%. But while these intersex conditions, they do present physical variations, they don't create a third gender. Intersex conditions represent variations within these categories, not a separate gender category altogether. A scientific understanding shows that intersex conditions are anomalies within the male-female framework, not a deviation from it. But what about people who feel a deep, what's called an incongruence, with their biological sex. This is known as a term that we need to understand to have this conversation, gender dysphoria. You may have heard this, but this is actually a part of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And I don't mean to diminish anybody, I'm just giving you the science of it. This is in the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, approximately 0.0052% of the population experience this, this condition of gender dys dysphoria. And it's not a matter of preference. For this condition, it's a real distressing experience for those who have it. In other words, someone who with gender dysphoria may say, I feel like my body doesn't match who I am. And it's this sense of a disconnect that's very real for them. But we gotta understand, listen, while feelings may be powerful, they do not define truth. When your mind feels one way, but the billions of cells in your body carry a different truth, it's essential to recognize the body's biological blueprint doesn't lie. Every cell down to your DNA and your chromosomes is imprinted with your identity as a male or a female, a design so intricate and intentional that cannot be overridden by feeling when your brain says you're one thing, but the billions of cells in your body say the opposite. Listen to me, I don't mean to be rude. Your brain is wrong. Your, your, your brain. But another, ter another term to address any, you know, this in addition to gender dysphoria is what's called gender stereotypes. Gender stereotypes. One of the lies our culture has told us is, is that certain interests or behaviors indicate that someone might be transgender or non-binary. So a boy who likes pink, the world says they might be in the wrong body. But just because your child has interests that are outside of the traditional gender roles doesn't mean that they're confused about their gender. These are cultural stereotypes, not biblical mandates. Okay, in fact, let me show you. In 1918, there was this article in the Ladies Home Journal in 1918 that read this. The generally accepted rule is pink for the boys, and blue for the girls. The reason is that pink being a more decided and stronger color is more suitable for the boy, while blue, which is more delicate and dainty, is preferred for the girl. Isn't that ironic, you guys? Just a century, a century ago, the cultural definitions were completely reversed 
what this shows us is stereotypes are not fixed truths. They're, they're social constructs that change over time. God's design, on the other hand, is unchanging. Our world insists that gender is fluid, but biology, you know, in God's creation, they speak a different story. As followers of Christ, we got to stand on the unchanging truth. That biology, listen to me, it's not bigotry. And truth is not transphobic. Can I get an amen, somebody? Amen. Biology is not bigotry. And truth is not transphobic. Let's move to this second question, though. The second question that we need to answer is, what does the Bible then say? Understand what biology says, but what does the Bible say about male and, and female? Culture may try to muddy the water here, but God's word, it, it provides clarity. The Bible is not ambiguous about identity. It's precise and intentional. God, the creator of all things, has woven his design into creation, and that includes the creation of male and female. We see God's intentional design from the beginning. Genesis chapter 1. Verse 27, so God created mankind in his own image, the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Notice the wording here, male and female, he created them. This is not a spectrum. This is not a sliding scale. It's a distinct design with a purpose. God didn't create us as a blank canvas to be painted with whatever colors culture is using in that season. He created us with intentionality in his own image. God created male and female on purpose, with a purpose. And I want you to know today that when the creator of the universe designs something, he does not make mistakes. He isn't saying, whoops, I forgot to include 50 other options here. No, he created male and female, and he saw that it was very good. And when God says something is very good, good. You don't need a reboot. You don't need an upgrade. He designed it already flawless. Now, someone might say, but Jesus didn't talk about transgender issues, Pastor Jason. Well, Jesus didn't talk about smartphones and the internet either. But the principles still apply. Matthew chapter 19, he says, haven't you read that at the beginning, Jesus says the creator made them male and female. For this reason, a man's going to leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Why is this important? Because Jesus himself, the Son of God, affirmed the Genesis creation account. He affirmed the creation of two genders and the binary nature of God's plan for marriage and family. Jesus did not leave room for cultural reinterpretation. This is the design. Jesus said, this is the blueprint. This is clear. This is simple. This is unchanging. Our culture loves to tell us that if we don't like ourselves, we can change. But God says something very different. Psalm 139, verse 13 and 14, it says, For you, God, created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your work is even wonderful, and I can see it. I know it full well. Think about this, you guys. God knits you. Stitch by stitch with intention and care. You are not an accident. You are a project of God. You're not a project that needs constant tweaking. God didn't give you a DIY kit and go, here you go, figure it out. He crafted you with love and precision. He calls you wonderful. We need to embrace this truth. We find freedom from the pressure to be anything other than what God has made us to be. You're not a mistake that needs correcting. You are a masterpiece that needs, needs embracing. Yes, God's design is perfect, but we need to address the reality. We live in a fallen world full of sin and brokenness. And this is what we have to understand in this conversation. Everything is twisted and broken because of sin. Romans chapter 8 verse 20 says that creation, look at what it says, is confused. Creation is the world is not at it was meant to be. Because of sin, we experience confusion, pain, suffering, and we see this distortion everywhere from our relationships, from our very identities. All of creation is in a state of confusion because of sin. In fact, later in that same uh, chapter, Romans chapter 8, verse 22, he says, we know that all creation is even still groaning and in pain. Like a woman about to give birth, but now, he says, we groan silently while we wait for God to show that we are his children. This means that our bodies will also be set free. 
There is like our bodies are broken and ill and, and, and confused and all these, the confusion and struggles we see today, even in the area of gender and identity are symptoms of a world that is waiting for redemption. Let me, let me get to this third question that's really important. What does a parent do if their child says, I think I'm transgender or non-binary? What, what do you do, mom and dad? This is happening more and more now, not because of gender dysphoria, but because of peer pressure. But because of social media and a demonic influence in our world, in our political system, in Hollywood, in our media, everywhere around. Like, you better be careful of what is going in your kids' brains, eyes, and ears. What do we do, though? Because this is the world we're living in. They're going to see it, or they may even come to you and say, I think I'm transgender or non-binary. First and foremost, you must love them. In fact, I would say, like, love them like you've never loved them before. They should never doubt, mom and dad, never doubt in their mind your love or your loyalty to them. It doesn't mean, listen to me, that you agree with everything they say or do, but it does mean they know that you are there for them unconditionally. Because you can love someone, listen, without affirming everything they believe. You, You can disagree without being disrespecting. It's essential to understand that, that love and affirmation, they're not the same thing. See, because culture tries to tell us, if you love me, then you'll affirm me. But true love doesn't say yes to everything. Sometimes love has to say no, because it cares more about the person's well-being than their immediate happiness. 2 Timothy chapter 4 says that there's a time, a time will come that I believe we're living in right now. A time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, They will multiply teachers for themselves. They'll surround themselves with people because they have an itch to hear what they want to hear. Let me just be, let me get an echo chamber. Let me just kind of tell me what I want to hear. They will turn away from the hearing of the truth and will turn aside to miss. The world's definition of love has become so twisted that it equates love with affirmation. But if we equate love with affirmation, we're essentially saying that our children's feelings are always right. But let's be clear, affirmation is not a requirement of love. If we affirmed everything our kids believe, they'd be eating ice cream for breakfast and skipping school by age five. Love is not about saying yes to every feeling. It's about guiding your child toward truth. So parents, let me remind you, it's okay to say no when your child is making a decision that could impact the rest of their life. In fact, research from the National Institute of Mental Health shows that a child's brain, check this out, is not fully developed until their mid to late 20s. Why then would we let them make irreversible decisions about their bodies before they've even fully matured? And then listen, I'm not like, this isn't a criticism to like anyone young in here today. You know, my brain didn't fully turn on until my mid 20s. Some days I wonder if it's even on, you know what I mean? I'm like, am I... But the point is, just as we wouldn't let a 10-year-old get a tattoo, we need to be wise about decisions that have lifelong consequences. Sometimes the best thing we can do as parents is allow our kids to grow through the natural tensions of life without trying to rush them to the solution and rescue them. In our society, we've established very clear age requirements for decisions that impact a person's life. You need to be 16 to drive a car. You need to be 18 to smoke or to vote. You got to be 21 to drink alcohol. You got to be 18 to get a tattoo. But we set these limits because we recognize that maturity, judgment, and life experience matter when making big, significant choices. Yet there is a movement allowing children, some as young as 12 years old, to make irreversible decisions about their gender transition without parental consent. If we believe young people aren't ready to take the responsibility of driving or or even choosing a tattoo until they reach adulthood, how much more should we pause before supporting permanent life-altering changes in the body of a young person? We got to hold, listen, lawmakers and medical practitioners accountable for the destruction that they are causing to these children. There's a powerful story of a young woman who was transitioned at 14 years old. She went through um, uh, the the puberty blockers and and surgeries only to realize at age 20 she made a mistake. She actually took her, and many people are doing this now, we're seeing more and more people. She took her case to court against the the practice and against the the therapist, and, and she won. On the witness stand, she said something so haunting. She said, where were the adults? 
This is what she said at 20 years old on the witness stand. Where were the adults to tell me this wasn't the right time to make this kind of decision? As parents, we're called to guide our children through tough times, even when they don't understand the wisdom of waiting. True love is willing to be misunderstood to protect your child's tomorrow. There's, I, in one talk about this subject, I cannot hit everything. So I, I, we actually have prepared, and every week we have prepared, based upon the Truth Over Trend topic, tons of resources, articles, and, and data, and studies, and research. So if you want to scan the QR code on the screen, parental resources on this topic. You want to know how to be, how to have this conversation in a healthy way. We have on our Discovery Church app put tons of resources for this topic, and every week we'll add based upon that topic. But being a parent, let me just say, means making decisions that your children might not understand now, but they'll thank you for later. See, the easy road is to give in to every desire, every whim, every new cultural trend, but the path of true love is different. It's about leading them toward truth. It's about protecting their future. It's about pointing them to a savior who can transform their heart and restore the brokenness that is inside of all of us, okay? Okay, let me get to the fourth question. Number four. Is God okay with homosexuality? This is a question that many people ask, and you might stand on one side of this um, equation or aisle of this, but I'm not honestly interested in your opinion. I'm not even interested in my opinion. I want to know what the truth says. Come on, somebody. So what what does God say? It's not about me or you or them. It's about what does God say? Please hear me out on this without a, a lot of pushback. Just hear me out for a moment. God didn't create you a homosexual. God didn't create you as as transgender or something like that. People say, how could God judge me? I was born this way. He made me this way. That is an assumption that is based on a fallacy. You were born the way you were born because of sin. Remember, God created Adam and Eve, and he said it was very good. And then he gave them a choice, and they chose selfishness, and that nature of sin, listen to me, was passed down. And now the sin of your father and your father's father and your father's father's father and your father's 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 father lives in your DNA and your genes passed down for generations. You have a proclivity, some of us, toward alcoholism and towards addictions because of the sin of generations past. God didn't create you that way. You've inherited sin on in our generations, but he wants to restore you and recreate you, make you a new creation, take away your sins of your fathers and restore the ability to reflect God's glory. He didn't create you a homosexual. That is a lie from the pit of hell that culture has sold you. Our culture says, follow your heart. God says, follow me. And there's only one of those decisions. When you make it, it leads to destruction and the other one will lead to life will lead to healing, will lead to wholeness. Your identity is not in your desires. It's in the one who designed you. And and, and there's so much I could talk about this topic, and there's a lot actually on those resources. There's an an, an extensive response to to this question about homosexuality in the Bible. You need to take a look at it on our app. But let me, because let me just give you a few scriptures, and I'll give them to you in the New Testament, because I know some people say, well, that's Old Testament. No, it's New Testament as well. Let me give you a few scriptures and interpret them with you. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10 says, or do you, do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexual, sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor, and the, the Greek word here is arsenikotai, which is a, very, a new word that, that actually the Apostle Paul created as a compound word that, that makes it maybe, for some people, debatable, and I'll tell you why it's not debatable, but here's how they translate it. Men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor the slanderers, nor the swindlers who inherit the kingdom of God. We like to, by the way, we like to focus on one of those things, but some of you are in the other parts of that list that you need to, you know, take the log out of your eye before you judge the speck in somebody else's eye, Okay. Okay, so don't get, I am focusing on one of these, but I'm going to get to the rest in a moment, okay? So just, but I am focusing on one to answer the question. The cross doesn't single anyone out. It calls everyone to come, repent, and be renewed. First, First Timothy chapter 1, here's, here's another time. That word that Paul created, he used it again in, in verse uh, 9 and 10. 
He says, we also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for the lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and the sinful, the unholy and the irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, and for those practicing, here's that word again, arsenokotai, and this time they translated it homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine. In both of these passages, we find that specific word, arsenokotai, the word is sometimes translated men who have sex with men or those who practice homosexuality. But what does that mean exactly? The word arsenokotai is a compound word of two Greek words that were put together that Paul actually puts them together that were not put together before. Arsen means male, and kotai is derived from a word meaning bed or to lie down next to. So, which is often a euphemism in the, in the Bible, bed or lying down next to is uh, having sexual relations. And, and when Paul used this term, he's directly referencing homosexual relationship. And I think it's the wisdom of God here that he didn't use the word that is used for homosexuality in that time because words and definitions and what is, what is culturally acceptable and not change. And so someone might say in a different generation or a different time or a different culture, well, this isn't homosexuality, this is love. Well, this isn't homosexuality. This is not that what the Bible says, this is this. And so Paul didn't use the cultural term for homosexuality. He created his own term that would never be disputed ever because it is just, hey, it's any time a male is lying down in a bed next to a male doing stuff they shouldn't be doing, you go, you, that's not God's will. So he didn't even use the word that was used so, so someone can change the definition. He's saying, look, no, no, no. When a male is laying next to in bed with another male and doing things they shouldn't be doing, that's not God's will for your life. So at all cultures, at all times, everyone would understand, even if the word homosexuality changed from one culture to the next, no, no, he didn't use that word. He used a very clear language and said, this is wrong. This is not God's will for creation. Some who challenge this interpretation, uh, B Bishop Gene Robinson, for example, the first openly gay bishop, which is an oxymoron, but anyway, in a major Christian denomination. It's one thing, listen, to be gay is, to have same-sex attraction is, is not a sin. You can be a Christian, and I know a lot of Christians who, have, who struggle with same-sex attraction. We, we are sinners by nature and have, have dysfunction and have proclivities and leanings. And some people, it might be alcohol, alcoholism or addiction or lust or homosexuality tendencies or attraction. It, whatever it is, the, the temptation is not the sin. It's you actually acting upon it is the sin. So it don't matter if you have same-sex attraction or whatever your cross to bear is, whatever that cross is, deny yourself die daily and follow him. Amen? Okay. So, so he, he's, he's in the Episcopal church and he argues that arsenokotai is a mystery word. And this is what people will say. It's a mystery word. It's just too rare to understand its full meaning for us to judge and condemn an entire group. It's just so unchristian. But that word, that just does not hold up because the whole, the word is rare, but the components and the usage of the context in scripture is very clear. Paul knew what he was saying. The church knew what he was saying when the Bible was written. The early church knew. Early church fathers knew. All throughout generation and history knew. Everybody knew at all times. And now people want to redefine words to, to, for their own cultural definitions. Cultural confusion does not change biblical clarity. God's word is unchanging even when the world tries to twist it. See, the Bible isn't anti-love. It's pro-God design. Okay, God created marriage and sexuality with a purpose, and when we step outside of that purpose, we miss the fullness of what God intended. Remember, truth without grace is hollow, but truth without love is harsh. God's design for marriage, one man and one woman, it's not random, and it's not a random rule. It's a reflection of his relationship with us. It's a covenant, not a contract. Now, let me, let me I want to give you a response. How should we respond in our generation and time to these, these challenging cultural issues related to transgenderism and homosexuality. Before I tell you how to respond, let me read a lengthy portion of Scripture. I didn't, I, I'm not putting it, I didn't put it in your notes because it's like a whole chapter. I want to read a whole chapter with you. Y'all okay if we read the Bible together? Okay, because this is like we're getting the truth. So let me just, let me put up Romans chapter 1, 
um, almost the whole, the whole thing, okay? So let's just, let's just read the Bible together. In Romans chapter one, the apostle Paul is writing to the Christians in Rome who had a lot of these challenges that we're dealing with today with identity and homosexuality and transgenderism and, and sin and brokenness, same, same challenges. Here's what he says. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and the wickedness of people who suppress, look at this, who suppress the truth by their wickedness. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna suppress what is, what is evident. I'm gonna suppress, I'm just gonna ignore, I'm gonna, I'm gonna even make illogical arguments and not to, like, I'm gonna suppress this truth by wickedness. Since what may be known about God is very plain, the questions we answer today are very plain to them because God has made it plain to them for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities his eternal power and divine nature has been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Every one of us are without excuse for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, so he's not Lord. You're not gonna be the one to call the shots here nor gave thanks to him, but I'm gonna make up my own mind and my thinking. They say they became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, you guys, you're backwards for believing this. You're backwards. You're going against science now. Somehow there's a new science about this. You're going, you're backwards. They claim to be wise. They become fools and exchange the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, here's what God is doing and has done. Therefore, God gave them over in the, in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. Look what it says. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And that's what all of us, we all have that same choice. When we are confronted in our soul, in our behavior, in our lifestyle, in our decisions with truth, do we conform to it or do we exchange it? They exchanged the truth of God of what was clear to be true for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised, amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Now, some might say, well, that was consensual. No, 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 the, the Bible is very clear whether it was consenting or not. This is not about consent, it's about truth. It's God's truth. It's not about what you believe or what you feel, or what they believe and what they feel. It doesn't make it right. Who gets to call it? Who, what truth are you, are you exchanging truth for? Your truth, their truth, for God's truth. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind, which makes this conversation very, very hard. How do you even have, I'm going to help you out with this. How do you even have this conversation then? I'll, I'll help you answer this question. So that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness. Here's our world, evil, greed, and depravity, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They, look at this, this is just our world, invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents, the list goes on. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. All they, they, they know God's righteous decree. It's not an offense when you embrace it. They know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death. They not only continue to do these very things, but will try to convince kindergartners, children, in their deception of what is right and what is good and approve of those who practice them. Now, this is what we see happening in the world. It was happening then, it's happening now. What is our response to this? The very next verse is chapter two. You know, the very next verse though, it says this. 
Paul says, you, therefore, have no excuse. Who passed judgment on someone else? For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. You go, no, 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 I didn't do that. No, no, you did. You are sinned and broken. And that part of the list might not have been you, but I promise you there's other parts of that list. If you looked into the mirror of God's word, you will be convicted by it instead of judging others. So here's how he says the prompts. Now, now we, knew who, we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. Not world's truth, not opinion. It's based on God. He's the one. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Truth is him. So when you are a mere human being, you pass judgment on them and yet do the same things. I'm not doing the same thing. No, 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 no. You are sinning. You sin. You're in the list. I promise you. Come back next week. Do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing, church, we got to receive this and never forget it, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. This is, God does not use his law, religion, rules, standards, righteousness. He doesn't use those things to save a soul. What does he use according to the word of God? He uses kindness. It's the kindness of the Lord. It's not your alienation. It's not your affirmation. It's not your avoidance. It's your accepting, loving, hugging, embracing somebody who is just like me and just like you, broken, in need of a savior, on the journey of transformation, of becoming who God desire us to be. So as we close, I want to look at these four biblical steps then to responding to these complex issues with conviction, conviction and compassion. These are practical steps that are going to align with God's truth. This, this LGBT uh, uh, biblical response, okay? Write this down. Number one, you guys... It's love first. Your response towards the transgender movement and homosexuality is love first. We are called to love first. You know why? Because that's what God did to you. That's what God does to us. He loves us first. He didn't require something first, approving, a, a, a changing. It's love first. First John 4, 19. We love because he first loved us. We don't love because they get it right or they agree or they're not this and they're not. No, no, no. We love not because of anyone else. We love because of him. Him. It's not, your love is not conditional based on any person. It's love first. Real love isn't passive. It actively pursues the best in others. Love doesn't mean agreeing with everything. It means caring deeply enough to speak the truth. Love says I'm with you, but I won't lie to you. True love doesn't just accept people as they are. It invites them to become all that they were created to be. If love doesn't lead, please hear me, the truth won't be heard. If love doesn't lead, the truth won't be heard. So what do we do, church? What do you do as a child of God in a dark age? Love first. Number two is gospel next. The gospel follows love. The gospel follows your kindness. The gospel follows your acceptance. It's love first, gospel next. Romans chapter 1 16 says, I'm not ashamed of this gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel isn't just a message of comfort. It's a call to transformation. Our job isn't to edit the gospel to make it more palatable. Our job is to proclaim it boldly. The gospel has the power to change hearts, to heal brokenness, to restore identity. The gospel doesn't just accept you where you are. It calls you to a life you could never imagine. Love first. Gospel next. This is who we are at Discovery. This is, this is how we, every issue, cultural, whatever, jacked up, we're all messed up. Love first. Gospel next. Number three, Bible follows. Now, this is where 
A lot of people get mixed up, man. This is what I, I, the Bible, that's what I taught you today. This isn't what you lead with. Too many Christians lead with the Bible and lead with their version of truth and their version, lead with the Bible. No, that's not the way. It's love first, gospel next. And the Bible is what follows, the scripture, the truth that we are to be transformed and conformed into. Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Do you know that's talking to you? That's me and you. We have a lot of deconforming to do and transforming by the renewing of your mind that you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will over my my. Decades of following Jesus, there has been a transformation and conforming as God revealed will. There are some things I believed and thought then. I don't believe anything now because God's changing my heart and my mind. He's transforming me. The Bible is our anchor in our culture that's constantly drifting. We're called to stand on God's word, not to bend to fit societal trends. God's word was true yesterday. It's true today, and it's going to be true tomorrow. Culture shifts. But God's word stands. We don't change the Bible to fit the world. We invite the world to be transformed by the word. Finally, number four, we trust God. We trust God with the work of transformation, doing what seems like impossible now. How could I be or do or become? How in the world? I don't see how it'll work. Trust God. And if you didn't get it, this Response is L-G-B-T. Love first, gospel next, Bible follows, trust God. I wanted to give you a response to L-G-B-T. It all ends with trusting God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. That old nature. This is what God desires to do with every single one of us. He wants to take your old nature that is confused, that is distorted, that does not reflect the glory of his creation the way it intended. And he wants to change you and transform you to where the old is gone and a new creation has come. Trusting God means that we believe he's still in the business of making all things new. We don't have to force transformation. We just need to be faithful to share the truth and trust him with the rest. God doesn't just modify behavior. He creates a new heart. Transformation is his work. Our job, listen, is to trust him to do it. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.